I never imagined I'd find the courage to escape. But here I was, sneaking through the dark hallway of my parents' house. My name is Scarlet, and for twenty years, my parents had made my life a living hell. I pulled my threadbare coat tighter around me, my eyes darting back and forth, making sure they were still asleep. Every step I took was calculated, careful not to put too much weight on the creaky floorboards. I knew all too well what would happen if I woke them. The scars on my arms, hidden beneath my long sleeves, were a constant reminder of their anger. As I reached the kitchen, my stomach growled painfully. I grabbed the bowl of oatmeal I had hidden in the back of the fridge for this very moment. My parents kept all the good food locked away where I couldn't reach it. I knew I needed to be smart about this. The food would have to last until I was far away from here. With the bowl of oatmeal safely tucked into my bag, I made my way to the front door. As I carefully turned the key, I heard a creak from my parents' bedroom. My heart nearly stopped when I heard my father call out my name. Sometimes he talked in his sleep. I prayed this was one of those times. I stood frozen, barely breathing, knowing that if he caught me trying to escape, the beating would be worse than ever. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, I finally opened the door and slipped out into the night. The cool air hit my face, and for a moment, I felt a surge of hope. At twenty years old, I'd never been allowed to study or learn anything. All I wanted was to work, to earn enough money to never go hungry again. But as I stepped onto the street, my plans came to a sudden halt. There, leaning against the cold brick wall of an alley, was a man who looked even worse off than me. He was thin, his lank hair framing a face that, despite the dirt, still held traces of remarkable beauty. The man looked up, surprise flickering in his eyes as he realized I was actually acknowledging his existence. My heart ached for him. How many people must walk by every day, pretending not to see him? I hesitated, my carefully laid plans crumbling in the face of this man's obvious suffering. As bad as things were for me at home, at least I got one meal a day. This man probably hadn't eaten in who knows how long. Before I knew what I was doing, I found myself walking towards him, the bowl of oatmeal still in my hands. I don't know your name, I said softly, but you look like you need this more than I do. I held out the bowl, watching as the dim streetlight illuminated the gratitude in his eyes. Stephen, he said, his hands shaking as he took the bowl. My name is Stephen, and you must be Scarlet. I felt a jolt of fear run through me. How do you know my name? I asked, unable to keep the suspicion out of my voice. Stephen looked at me for a moment before answering. I heard someone saying your name earlier when I was passing by. He looked down at the bowl in his hands. Why are you doing this for me? His voice was hoarse, filled with the distrust of someone who had little reason to expect kindness from the world. I glanced around, making sure the night still cloaked us in darkness and silence. Because I know what it's like to be hungry, I confessed in a low voice. The admission felt both freeing and like a new burden. I can't just leave you here alone when I know you need help. Stephen studied me with new eyes, a faint curve touching the corner of his mouth. In that moment, standing there with this stranger, I felt a connection I had never experienced before. For the first time in my life, I had chosen to help someone else, even at the cost of my own plans, and somehow, that choice made me feel stronger than I ever had before. I never thought I'd find myself in this situation, sharing a meager bowl of oatmeal with a homeless man in a dilapidated shed. But here I was, sitting next to Stephen, both of us warmed by the steam rising from the bowl between us. You, you should eat more, Stephen insisted, pushing the spoon toward me. You look hungry. I shook my head, even as my stomach growled traitorously. I've already eaten, I lied, not wanting him to worry. Besides, you need it more than I do. The truth was, I was starving. My mother's slap still stung on my cheek a harsh reminder of the price I paid if caught sneaking extra food. But seeing the relief on Stephen's face as he took his first bite made it all worth it. I can't promise much, 
I told him, but I'll help you as much as I can. The determination in my voice surprised even me. For the first time in my life, I felt like I was making a real difference, even if it was just for one person. Stephen looked at me with a mixture of curiosity and admiration. You can't save the world, you know, he said gently. I felt a strength growing inside me as I replied, maybe not, but I can try to make a difference where it matters. I pointed to the shed at the far end of the street. It isn't much, but I know my parents never go there. You can stay there, at least for tonight, I offered. It's too cold out here. I feel terrible if you froze by morning. Stephen nodded and followed me to the shed. As he settled in, placing the bowl on a makeshift surface, he turned to me with a sad smile. You've got a good heart, young lady, too good for this cruel world. His words hit me hard, and I felt the irony of my situation wash over me. I'm just trying to be the person my parents never were, I said softly, turning to leave. The urge to run away was still pulsing through my veins, but I knew I couldn't leave Stephen here alone and hungry. Take care, Stephen, I whispered. If you need anything else, I'll do my best to help. As I left the shed, I made a decision. I would stay at my parents' house a little longer, at least until Stephen was well-fed and strong enough to fend for himself. Then, I promised myself I would make my escape. The next morning, I snuck into the kitchen before my parents woke up. My hands shook as I prepared breakfast, making a little extra. If I do this every day, they won't notice the difference, I muttered to myself as I stirred the oatmeal. But as I was spooning the extra portion into a container, I heard my mother's footsteps on the stairs. My heart raced, but I forced myself to stay calm. Good morning, Mom, I said with a fake smile. I made a little extra breakfast for you both today. My mother eyed me suspiciously. Food is expensive, she snapped. You eat too much. Before I could react, her hand flew out, striking me across the face. This is to teach you not to waste, she hissed. You won't eat anything more today. I fought back tears as she snatched the bowl away from me after just three bites. But I knew I had to be careful. If they caught on to what I was doing, the consequences would be severe. As soon as I had the chance, I grabbed the hidden container and slipped out the back door. Every step felt heavy with the weight of responsibility. My cheeks still stung from my mother's slap, but I pressed on. Stephen needed me. When I reached the shed, I found Stephen still asleep, curled up in the corner for warmth. Stephen, wake up, I whispered, gently touching his shoulder. I brought you some food. He stirred slowly, looking at me with a mix of gratitude and disbelief. You really came back, he said, his voice hoarse. As we sat there, sharing the warm oatmeal, I felt a connection I had never experienced before. For the first time in my life, I was doing something that truly mattered. Despite the risks, despite the fear, I knew I would keep coming back for as long as Stephen needed me. I never thought I'd be sharing a meager bowl of oatmeal with a homeless man. But here I was, watching Stephen eat slowly, life seemingly returning to his eyes. He insisted I eat half before he would take a bite himself. His kindness, despite his desperate situation, touched my heart in ways I couldn't explain. You're different from the others, Scarlet, Stephen said softly. Most people just ignore me, but you, you have a heart this cruel world couldn't break. I smiled sadly, feeling a mix of pride and sorrow. Maybe, I replied but there's still so much to do. I knew this small act of kindness wasn't enough to completely change Stephen's situation, but it was a start, a glimmer of hope in a world that often seemed devoid of it. As I made my way back home, my mind was already racing with plans to secure more food without raising suspicion. I was determined not to let my parents' cruelty define who I was or the impact I could have on the world around me. The rest of the day passed in a blur of menial chores, as it always did. By evening, I was exhausted, but when I entered my room, the sight of a covered dish on a silver tray jolted me awake. Lifting the cover, I gasped. It was a meal fit for a dream, 
fruits, vegetables, meat, even a small dessert cup, foods I rarely, if ever, got to taste. Did mom feel guilty about hitting me this morning? I wondered as I savored each bite. The nutritious meal made me feel stronger, healthier than I had in ages. The next morning, however, reality hit hard. The cold was becoming overwhelming as winter approached rapidly. As I made my way to the shed with Stephen's oatmeal, my breath was visible in the frigid air. I realized he would need more than just food to survive. When I found Stephen shivering under his thin blanket, which barely retained any warmth, I knew I had to act. You need more than this to stay warm, I murmured, feeling helpless but determined to help. That afternoon, while my parents were out, I searched the attic for unused clothes and blankets. Each item I put in the bag increased my anxiety. If they noticed these things missing, I'd be in for it. They can't realize these are gone, I thought, carefully collecting items they hadn't used in years. With a heavy bag on my shoulder, I ran to the shed under the cover of darkness. Each step was a calculated risk. I opened the door slowly, finding Stephen huddled in the corner. I brought you something, I whispered, setting the bag down in anxious silence. Stephen's eyes lit up as he peered inside. Don't worry about it, I said, forcing a smile, even as my heart raced with the fear of discovery. Just use them to keep warm, okay? Stephen took my hand, his cold fingers intertwining with mine. Scarlet, you do so much for me. Why do you go to all this trouble? The intensity of his gaze deepened the question. I looked at our joined hands, finding an answer that felt true to my core. Because if I were in your place, I'd hope someone would do the same for me, I confessed, feeling a mix of fear and determination. I'll never forget this, Scarlet. Never, Stephen said, squeezing my hand. I nodded feeling a wave of warmth against the cold that had nothing to do with clothes or blankets. It was the warmth of the bond forming between us, a connection of gratitude and mutual care. As I made my way back home, tension built inside me. What if my parents discovered what I'd done? Each step towards the house increased my fear. The moon was hidden behind dark clouds, and the wind blew colder, as if foreshadowing trouble. But I knew, no matter what happened, I couldn't stop now. Stephen needed me, and for the first time in my life, I felt like I was truly making a difference. I never thought I'd be sneaking out of my own house in the middle of the night, but here I was, calculating the height of the drop from my bedroom window. The snow was falling silently outside, each flake a reminder of the bitter cold that Stephen was enduring in that rickety shed. I knew every second counted now as I whispered a quick prayer, asking God to protect me from injury and to keep Stephen safe. I couldn't help but feel a mix of fear and determination coursing through my veins. Stephen needs me, I reminded myself as I gathered the courage to jump. The impact of hitting the ground knocked the wind out of me, but miraculously I was unharmed. Whether it was divine intervention or sheer luck, I didn't have time to ponder. I raced towards the shed, my heart pounding with each step. What I found inside shook me to my core. Stephen was pale and delirious, his breathing labored and painful. As I knelt beside him, he whispered between coughs that he didn't think he'd last much longer. Each word seemed to cost him tremendous effort. Despair washed over me, but I forced it down. Don't say that, Stephen, I said, trying to inject hope into my voice, even as fear clawed at my insides. I brought medicine and a warm blanket. You're going to be fine. Stephen's hand found mine, his grip weak but insistent. A faint smile played on his lips as he called me an angel, thanking me for not leaving him alone. The gratitude in his fading voice nearly broke me. As I helped him take the medicine, I could feel hot tears threatening to spill from my eyes. You have to fight, Stephen, I insisted, my voice cracking with emotion. I'm here with you. The thought of losing him, of him dying alone and forgotten in this cold shed, was overwhelming. Stay with me, I pleaded, offering up silent prayers for his recovery. 
I spent the next hour by his side, my mind racing with what to do next. I knew I couldn't leave him like this, but I also knew my absence would soon be discovered at home. Just a few hours earlier, I had barely avoided disaster when my parents returned home unexpectedly. I had managed to sneak back in through the back door, but their suspicion was palpable. Where is that girl? My mother's voice had cut through the air like a knife. I had frozen in place, my heart threatening to burst out of my chest. Quickly hiding the empty bag under a piece of furniture in the laundry room, I had rushed to the kitchen, trying to appear as natural as possible. I'm your mom, I had called out, fighting to keep the tremor out of my voice, just finishing up in the kitchen. My mother had entered the room, eyeing me with distrust. You've been outside, haven't you? She had accused, her eyes narrowing. A chill had run down my spine, but I had lied, praying my internal panic wasn't visible on my face. No, Mom, I've been here the whole time. Don't lie to me, she had snapped. Your father saw footprints in the snow leading to the shed. Her tone had been pure menace. You know what happens to lying girls, don't you? I had swallowed hard, my stomach churning with dread. Thinking quickly, I had concocted a story about checking on the tools in the shed because of the forecasted storm. My parents had exchanged glances, clearly not buying it. Let's hope that's true, my father had said as he entered the kitchen. But we're watching you. They had locked me in my room after that, the key safely in my mother's possession. As I sat there, feeling more like a prisoner than ever in my own home. My worry for Stephen had grown with each passing minute. Now, as I sat with him in the shed, I knew I had to find a way to get him real help, no matter the consequences. The storm was getting worse, and Stephen's condition was deteriorating rapidly. I couldn't let him die here, not when I had the power to do something about it. With renewed determination, I squeezed Stephen's hand. Hold on, I whispered. I'm going to get you out of here. Just hold on a little longer. As I said the words, I realized I had no idea how I was going to accomplish this, but I knew with every fiber of my being that I had to try. I never thought I'd be risking everything for a stranger, but here I was, shivering in the cold shed, watching as Stephen's color slowly returned to normal. As our eyes met, I was struck by how handsome he was, even in his weakened state. He must have noticed something in my gaze because he smiled at me, declaring that I was his salvation. My heart swelled with a mixture of pride and fear. I knew I couldn't leave him here another night, but sneaking him into my house seemed impossible. Still, I had to try. I'm going to find a way to get you somewhere warmer, I told him, trying to inject confidence into my voice. As I made my way back home, my mind raced with possibilities and potential disasters. But nothing could have prepared me for what awaited me. My mother was standing there, holding an empty medicine wrapper I had carelessly left behind. Her voice dripped with venom as she demanded an explanation. I felt the blood drain from my face as I stammered out a weak excuse about feeling ill, but she wasn't buying it. She cut me off, her face inches from mine, her eyes blazing with anger. She knew I had been out. She wanted to know who I had been meeting, what I was hiding. My heart pounded so hard, I was sure she could hear it. I knew that one wrong word could mean disaster, not just for me, but for Stephen too. If I was locked up again, he would be left alone in the cold, possibly to die. The thought made me feel sick. There's no one, Mom, I swear, I lied fighting to keep my voice steady. But she was determined to find out the truth. She grabbed my arm, practically dragging me towards the shed. Each step felt like lead, my heart pounding like a warning bell. To my immense relief and confusion, the shed was empty when we arrived. But as my mother pulled me back towards the house, threatening that this wasn't over, my mind spun with worry. Where had Stephen gone? Was he okay? That night was one of the longest of my life. I tossed and turned, my mind conjuring up horrible scenarios. What if Stephen had gotten worse and wandered off looking for help? What if he had died alone in the cold? By dawn, I was burning with fever, my chest aching with each breath, 
but I knew I couldn't give in to illness now, Stephen needed me. Wrapping myself in the thickest coat I could find, I waited for my chance to escape again. When I finally made it back to the shed, clutching a pot of warm soup and more medicine, I was nearly delirious with fever. Stephen, I called softly, my voice barely above a whisper. The relief I felt when I saw him still there, alive, was overwhelming. He looked at me with concern, noticing my pale, shaking form. I tried to smile as I handed him the soup and medicine, insisting I was fine, but as I sat beside him, I could feel my strength ebbing away. It's okay, Stephen, we both need this, I said, my voice trailing off. His weakness mirrored mine as I struggled to make my way home through the darkness and cold. I realized I might have pushed myself too far this time, but looking at Stephen, I knew I'd do it all again in a heartbeat. Sometimes, doing the right thing means taking risks, and for Stephen, I was willing to risk everything. I never thought I'd find myself in such a desperate situation, collapsed in the snow, my consciousness fading away. The world had started to spin dangerously, and before I knew it, I was on the ground, the cold seeping into my bones. I don't know how long I lay there, but the next thing I remember is waking up in the shed, wrapped in every blanket Stephen could find. As my eyes fluttered open, I saw Stephen's worried face hovering over me. He told me he had risked coming out of the shed to check on me and had found me unconscious in the snow. Despite his own weakness, he had somehow managed to carry me back to safety. You've saved my life so many times, Scarlet, he whispered, his voice thick with emotion. Now it's my turn to take care of you. I felt a warmth spread through me that had nothing to do with the blankets. As Stephen tended to me through the night, I drifted in and out of consciousness. In my more lucid moments, I noticed him studying me with a mix of concern and shock. It wasn't until later that I realized he had seen the bruises on my body, evidence of the abuse I had been trying so hard to hide. When morning came, I woke to find a carefully folded piece of paper next to my makeshift bed. With trembling hands, I unfolded it and began to read. My dear Scarlet, it began, and I felt my heart skip a beat. Stephen's words were full of hope and determination. He wrote about the new life he wanted us to have, far away from the cruelty we'd both known. He promised to come back for me, to take me somewhere I'd be cherished and loved. As I read, tears streamed down my face. How could I deserve such devotion? But reality crashed back all too quickly. I knew my parents would be furious if they discovered I was gone. And now, with Stephen's letter, the stakes were even higher. If they found out about him, who knows what they might do? I breathed a sigh of relief when I realized my bedroom door was still locked from the outside. Maybe they hadn't even bothered to check on me, but my relief was short-lived. That very afternoon, as I tried to go about my usual chores to avoid suspicion, my mother found the letter. What is this? She screamed, waving the paper in my face. Who's Stephen? What kind of relationship do you have with him? I felt my blood run cold as she continued her tirade, her voice growing louder with each word. I tried to explain, to make her understand that Stephen was just someone I was trying to help, but she wouldn't listen. A beggar? She sneered. You've been giving our food to a beggar? Before I knew it, my parents were making plans to leave town. They talked about going to my grandparents' house in the country, staying there until Stephen gave up. I felt my world crumbling around me. How could I leave Stephen behind? How could I abandon the one person who had shown me true kindness? As my parents rushed around, packing bags and making frantic phone calls, I stood there frozen. I knew I had to make a decision, and fast. But what could I do? Where could I go? For the first time in my life, I truly understood what it meant to be trapped between a rock and a hard place. I never thought I'd be fighting so hard to stay in a place I'd always wanted to escape. But here I was, begging my parents not to take me away. Please, I need to wait for him. I pleaded, but my words fell on deaf ears. My parents were already packing, determined to cut off any chance of me reuniting with Stephen. 
As chaos erupted around me, preparations for our hasty departure in full swing, I sat helplessly, clutching Stephen's letter like a lifeline. Come back soon, please, I whispered to the paper, praying silently that Stephen would find me before it was too late. In the midst of this upheaval, I knew I had to act. While my mother rushed around packing bags, I formulated a desperate plan. I needed a hiding place, somewhere I could wait for Stephen, away from my parents' watchful, punishing eyes. Seizing a moment when my parents were distracted, I slipped outside. My heart pounded with each furtive step, threatening to give me away. Suddenly, my father's voice cut through the silence, sharp as a knife. Where do you think you're going? I froze, then slowly turned to face him, trying to mask my fear with determination. I'm not going with you, I declared, my voice trembling but resolute. I can't leave my life and Stephen behind. My father advanced, anger etched in every line of his face. You don't have a choice, Scarlet. We're doing this for your own good. He reached for me, but I backed away, taking deep breaths to calm my rising panic. I darted back into the house, searching for a place to hide until I could find a way to escape. I slipped into the rarely visited attic, crouching behind some dusty boxes. It wasn't long before my parents found me. My mother held Stephen's letter, a look of bitter triumph on her face. This ends now, she said. Ripping the letter and throwing the pieces into the fireplace, my mother watched with satisfaction as Stephen's words turned to ash. I stood there, devastated, unable to speak. Without a word, I was forcibly led out of the house and pushed into the car. The journey to my grandparents' old country house was quiet and tense. I knew that once we arrived, I'd never be able to leave. I was familiar with the structure of the old, almost derelict house, but escaping from there would be impossible. With each passing mile, it felt like another nail was being driven into the coffin of my future. Upon arrival, I was locked in a small room on the second floor. The barred window faced the front of the house, but it was too high to jump from, and the bars were too close together for me to slip through. I sat by the window, staring at the distant horizon. I've lost Stephen, I whispered to the wind, he'll never find me now, and I can't escape. A single tear rolled down my cheek as I realized the fight to protect my freedom and future with Stephen was over. Trapped in this room with its barred window, I desperately searched for a way out. I was determined to get back to Stephen, knowing he would return to the place he last saw me. I found a hairpin on the floor and tried to pick the lock. My fingers moved frantically, but with each failure, my fear of never seeing Stephen again grew. I have to get out of here, I told myself, my labored breathing echoing in the quiet room as I worked on the lock. My mind raced with memories of Stephen, the kindness he'd shown me, the future we had dreamed of together. I couldn't let it end like this, I wouldn't. I never thought I'd be so desperate to escape a place I once called home, but here I was, my last hope, a flimsy hairpin, broken in my trembling hands. Frustration washed over me as I slumped against the cold wall, muttering, this can't be happening. The reality of my situation descended on me like a heavy curtain of despair. This attic room, once my sanctuary, now felt like a prison. Its narrow walls in isolation, which once offered solace, now only amplified my anguish and fear. I huddled in the corner, knees drawn to my chest, listening to the wind whistle through the gaps in the old wood. Each gust seemed to mockingly remind me of my hopeless situation. A new fear gripped me. What if my parents forgot to bring me food or water? I was trapped in this isolated part of the house, completely at their mercy. Why? Why did they hate me so much? I couldn't understand it. Though physically distant, I could hear my parents' voices echoing in my mind, discussing my punishment. My mother's harsh voice declared that I needed to learn I couldn't defy their authority. My father agreed, his voice a low growl of impending threat. But it was their next words that chilled me to the bone. How much do you think she's worth? My mother asked. Tears streamed down my face as the implications of her words sank in. Were they planning to sell me? 
the thought was too horrifying to contemplate. I tried to make myself smaller, as if I could disappear into the walls. Every minute in this attic was a minute won against whatever fate my parents had planned for me, but also a minute lost, a minute further from Stephen. He must be looking for me. I whispered to myself, trying to inject some hope into my crushed spirit. I have to find a way back to him. As night fell and the temperature dropped, I crawled to the small broken fireplace. Using scraps of wood I found scattered around, I managed to start a small fire. The flickering flames offered little comfort, but it was enough to warm my body and provide a glimmer of solace. God, please help me, I prayed watching the shadows dance on the walls. Let Stephen find me. Despite the weight of uncertainty pressing down on me like a suffocating blanket, a spark of determination still burned in the depths of my heart. I would survive this. I would reunite with Stephen and escape my parents' oppressive grip. As I finally drifted off to sleep, my face illuminated by the dying embers, I clung to dreams of freedom and the dark promise of seeing Stephen again. Tomorrow, I thought. Tomorrow, when they bring food, I might have a chance to get out of here. In the pre-dawn darkness, I was jolted awake by the distant sound of an approaching car. My heart leaped. Could it be someone coming to help me? I wanted to bang on the window, to scream for help, but fear of punishment held me back. Instead, I peered through the barred window, trying to see who had arrived. As I watched and waited, I realized that every decision, every moment, could be the difference between freedom and captivity, between a life with Stephen and a future I couldn't bear to imagine. I had to be smart, I had to be brave, and above all, I had to hold on to hope. It was all I had left. I never thought I'd see Stephen again, let alone looking like this. As I peered through the bars, I could barely recognize the well-dressed man stepping out of an unfamiliar car. But when he turned toward the house, my heart skipped a beat. It was Stephen, but not the Stephen I remembered. He had transformed, elegantly dressed, his posture radiating confidence. I pressed my face against the bars, tears of relief mingling with a surge of new hope. How did he get those clothes? That car, what's going on? I whispered to myself, my mind racing with questions. As Stephen approached the front door, my parents emerged to confront him. I could see everything from my vantage point, but they couldn't see me. My father's gruff and suspicious voice demanded to know who Stephen was and what he wanted. Stephen's response was firm and clear. He told them he had come for me, that he was here to take me away. I strained to hear their words, but the thick walls of this old house muffled their voices. My mother's voice, dripping with sarcasm, cut through the air. She sneered that Stephen didn't look like a beggar anymore, asking if he really thought he could just come here and take their daughter. But Stephen remained calm in the face of their accusations. He declared that I deserved a better life than the one filled with fear and violence that they had provided. He said he had the means to take care of me, to give me the life I deserved. I watched as my parents exchanged glances, probably thinking about selling me to the highest bidder. Neither of them truly cared about me, when my father challengingly asked what would happen if they refused. Stephen's response sent chills down my spine. If they refused, he told them he would have to take legal measures to ensure my safety, including revealing to the police everything he knew about how they treated me. His voice was as cold as the morning air. As I continued to watch from the window, I felt a mix of admiration and fear for what Stephen might face for my sake. When he mentioned having resources, I realized he must have carefully planned each step before coming to find me. My mother, realizing they were at a disadvantage, changed tactics. She lied, saying I had gone to live with an aunt far away and wouldn't be coming back. She demanded compensation for everything they had done for me if Stephen wanted me to return. Stephen nodded, seeing through their lies. You're trying to sell your own daughter, he stated. Where is Scarlet? I don't believe she's gone. But my mother insisted, closing the door in Stephen's face. 
As I watched his car begin to pull away, desperation overwhelmed me. My mother's words echoed in my mind, a cruel sentence of eternal isolation. With my heart pounding uncontrollably, I began banging on the window bars with all my might, screaming Stephen's name. Even though I knew it was almost impossible for him to hear me over the distance, and the strong wind rustling the trees outside, I couldn't stop. Stephen, Stephen, please don't go, I cried, my voice raw with emotion. Each second his car moved further away felt like another blow of crushing despair. In the car, Stephen felt a growing uneasiness. Something wasn't right. Just as he was about to accelerate, a faint sound, almost swallowed by the wind, reached his ears. He slammed on the brakes, his intuition screaming for attention. Stephen's heart raced as he leaped out of the car and ran back toward the house. I was still pounding on the window, my body shaking not just from the cold, but from the fear of losing him forever. Suddenly, Stephen's silhouette appeared in the morning mist. Scarlet, he shouted, locating me with determination burning in his eyes. He approached the door and began pounding on it, demanding my parents release me. The confrontation that followed was tense and charged with emotion. As I watched from above, I realized that this moment would define the rest of my life. Freedom was so close, yet still just out of reach. But Stephen was here, fighting for me, and for the first time in a long time, I dared to hope. I never thought I'd hear Stephen speak with such determination and authority. As I listened from my attic prison, his words echoed through the house. You have no right to keep her locked up like this. Scarlet deserves to be free, and I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that happens. My parents were caught between rage and fear of legal consequences. I could hear the panic in my mother's voice as she threatened Stephen, telling him I would never go with him and that she'd call the police for trespassing. But Stephen didn't flinch. I felt utterly helpless, trapped upstairs with no way to get down and out. The argument escalated quickly, and in the chaos, someone called the police. When they arrived, the scene must have been enough for them to take immediate action. My heart raced as I heard the commotion downstairs. Suddenly, Stephen was there, rushing to my side. Are you hurt? Did they harm you, Scarlet? He asked, his voice filled with concern. I assured him I was okay, though I was overwhelmed by the rapid turn of events. As my parents were taken away, I made the difficult decision not to press further charges. The police seemed surprised by my compassion, but I explained, I just want to move on with my life, away from the hatred and pain they caused me. My voice was steady but full of emotion. Stephen stood by me, offering the support I so desperately needed. He gently took my hand and promised, let's start a new life together, Scarlet. A life where you can be truly free, where you can have anything you want. I moved closer to him, my eyes reflecting a clear determination. All I wanted was a little peace in my life, to live as a normal woman, to study, work, and have a family. I had endured enough pain and resentment. Even though I chose not to press charges, the police couldn't overlook the conditions they found me in. My parents were arrested for what they had done. As we left the police station, I had so many questions for Stephen but he simply led me to a massive mansion without explanation. Stepping inside, I felt like a princess in an enormous castle. It was so luxurious that I stood there, mouth agape, following Stephen through the house. I felt as though I had entered a completely different world. The opulence of this place was in stark contrast to the simplicity and adversity I had faced until now. Stephen guided me through hallways adorned with art and furniture that looked like museum pieces. This is unbelievable, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. But why didn't you tell me about all this? Whose house is this? How did you get that car? And all of this. My curiosity was tinged with a hint of apprehension. I feared that what Stephen hadn't told me might change the feelings I had started to develop for him. Stephen sighed, stopping in front of a large window that offered a dazzling view of illuminated gardens. He began to explain his past.
a life of comfort but also loneliness and betrayal. People had always expected something from him, interested only in his money and what he could provide. As I listened to his story, I held his hand tightly. I couldn't understand why he had to suffer so much. But you were so sick, you almost died, I said, turning him to face me. He nodded, his eyes intense. Yes, but in my mind, I had been sick and alone for a long time before that. Living there with you was better than this luxurious life without love. Stephen's words warmed my heart. I had found someone who fought for me, who truly cared. That means everything to me, Scarlet, he said. As he continued to reveal more about his past, I smiled, moved by his sincerity. You did make a difference, at least for me, but what do we do now? Stephen's response filled me with hope. I want to start over, Scarlet, this time with you by my side. I want to make you as happy as you deserve to be, to make you smile every day, and to show you that the world can be wonderful with the right person beside you. What do you want, my Scarlet? In that moment, standing there with Stephen, I realized that sometimes life's greatest blessings come disguised as our biggest challenges. I had endured so much, but it had led me here, to this moment, to him. For the first time in my life, I felt truly seen, truly valued, and I was ready to embrace whatever the future held, as long as we faced it together. I never thought I'd find myself in the arms of someone who truly understood and loved me. But here I was, embracing Stephen with tears of joy in my eyes. I've always dreamed of studying, working, and someday, having a family that truly loves each other, without fear or hesitation, I confessed, my voice trembling with emotion. Stephen's response warmed my heart. He promised we'd make those dreams a reality together, sealing his words with a tender kiss. It felt like the beginning of a new chapter in my life one filled with hope and possibility. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, our love blossomed, healing old wounds and strengthening our bond. I threw myself into my studies, just as I had always wanted, with Stephen by my side every step of the way, encouraging and supporting me. We planned our future together and eventually celebrated our love with a simple yet meaningful wedding ceremony. As we strolled through our garden after the ceremony, I couldn't help but marvel at how far we'd come. It all started with an act of kindness on a dark street, I reminisced. You changed my life, Stephen. You gave me hope when I had nowhere to go. I'm healthier now, stronger both in body and spirit. Though I now wear elegant clothes, what I cherish the most is having someone who truly loves me. Stephen squeezed my hand gently, his smile full of affection. You gave me something worth fighting for, Scarlet, he said. A reason to believe in goodness again. Together, we felt compelled to give hope to others. We established a charity dedicated to helping people in vulnerable situations, like Stephen once was. Our project grew rapidly, fueled by our passionate commitment and Stephen's newfound purpose in philanthropy. During one of our planning meetings, I suggested we call it light for tomorrow. Because no matter how dark the past, everyone deserves a chance at a new beginning, I explained. Stephen agreed, his eyes full of admiration. It's perfect. You are my light for tomorrow, Scarlet. As time passed, our organization touched many lives, its positive impact resonating throughout the community. I often worked on the front lines, directly with those in need, as living proof that change was possible. Seven years later, on a sunny afternoon, I watched children playing in our foundation's courtyard. I felt a small hand slip into mine and looked down to see our eldest son gazing up at me with curiosity and admiration. Mom, were you always this brave? he asked. I crouched down to his eye level, smiling. I learned to be brave, my love. I learned that sometimes you have to be strong, not just for yourself, but for others too. As our family grew, I never forgot the lessons of my past. My parents remained in prison, a dark reminder of the hardships I'd overcome. We made the difficult decision to deny them access to our resources, preserving the integrity and security of the new life we had built. 
Watching Stephen play with our children, I felt a deep sense of gratitude. We had built something special together, not just a family bound by love and respect, but a place that reached beyond our walls to help others. We're making a difference, Stephen, I said, smiling as he approached and wrapped his arms around me. Yes, we are, he replied, kissing me softly. And we'll keep doing it together, always. As we stood there, wrapped in each other's love, we looked to the future with hope and determination. We knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, we could face them together, turning any adversity into opportunity. Our journey had taught us that even the darkest beginnings can lead to the brightest of futures.